Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. So what AI is good at today, it's very good about learning, whether it's machine, you know, deep learning, machine learning, machine intelligence, they're teachable today, right? You can teach an AI. And what I mean by AI, AI is everything from, you know, neural nets that are used to move trillions of dollars in nanoseconds around the world and for trading of stocks and bonds and to being able to run search engines to being able to decision support for doctors. I mean, very rote things like chatbots or voicemail or very mundane things we take somewhat for granted. AI today is getting better at learning. In fact, learning is what differentiates what we call AI from advanced analytics. Machine learning algorithms minimize an error function by autonomously and iteratively adjusting their model variables. But what's next for AI and machine learning? In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with James Canton, who in a meta way makes predictions about this prediction technology. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on the IoT Show is Dr. James Canton. James is a futurist, business advisor, and author. He is CEO and chairman of the Institute for Global Futures and wrote the recent book, Future Smart. For over 25 years, he's been speaking and advising clients on how to harness innovations to better compete. James, welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me. So how long have you been a futurist and what are the credentials needed to be a futurist? Well, I've been a futurist for, what, 30, 35 years, I guess, oh. uh, though I started a little earlier. Um, I, I, I actually had been a um apprentice, if you will, to Alvin Toffler, who wrote a seminal book uh, called Future Shock, mm, and right. uh, born and raised in New York. And, and I was part of an early group he had called the Anticipatory Democracy Network. <laughs> okay. and, and he had been a fortune editor. And uh, I, I worked with him and my undergraduate, uh, post my, un, my undergraduate work. And then I came out to uh, uh, I had my first think tank, the Health Policy Council, where I was doing futures for the uh, U.S. government on the future of healthcare. Mm-hmm. And of course, a lot of things we were talking, we've seen today, such as the impact of promotion, genetics, things that were coming. And then I came out and I joined Apple Computer. Uh, and I one of the first things I was asked when I joined the, the first Mac team with Steve Jobs and uh, Wozniak and kind of the, the crew down at Sil- in Cupertino was, you know, mm-hmm. what's the future is doing here? <laughs> and I said, well, I think computers are going to be really important. And since nobody's talking about in the future, right? <laughs> I got to figure it out. <laughs> so okay. that was my uh, first foray. How you become a futurist is one is there are a couple of university programs where you can get advanced degrees mm. in forecasting and, okay. and modeling, but you, this is one of these careers that you really got to you know, either apprentice with people and then you've got to do forecasts. You've got to be willing to forecast and figure out models and actually do the work. It's a little like being a cabinet maker. You've got to make cabinets and then those cabinets have to be good cabinets. So I've been forecasting and, and have, have a, a decent track record, uh, 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 often wrong, but never in doubt. Uh, but when it comes to technology, I really my entire life has been shaped by innovation waves, and I've had the privilege of being at the forefront of a number of them. 
So uh, I'm still, you know, it's only been 30 years. I'm I'm still getting the feel for it, Bruce. It takes it takes a while. Now I'm assuming you probably make predictions under 30 years. So that means you, yeah, you you probably have a scorecard, right? In terms of, but I suppose you could you can squint your eyes. But how's the scorecard looking? So I do forecasts in three um, uh, frameworks, and one to one to three years, which is everything from now to the next, you know, one to three years, and then three to five years, that's mid-range. So the short range, mid-range, and then long range. And then uh, 10 to 30. Oh, okay. That's the the long range? That's that's the super long range. That's the long range. And then uh, every now and then somebody will want me to look at something beyond that. Uh, But that's the range. And then my scorecard is pretty darn good, uh, except what's continually happened is as we're all – kind of uh, living in, in you know, more, a post Moore's law universe, mm-hmm. things are coming much faster and uh, much sooner. And uh, my forecasts have had to, you know, collapse time. I, I refer to it mm-hmm. in order to catch up. But I think that if anything, where it's my forecast has been off is that I, I, um, things have happened sooner than I thought, not later, except for uh, artificial intelligence, which, somewhat lagged and then finally caught up dramatically in the past couple of years. But I would say it's it's a pretty good, I would say about 80% of my forecasts have held up and I've been publishing since 1990, uh, uh, three books and publishing forecasts early on. So I, about 80% have been pretty good. And I again, I have an unfair advantage. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I get to, you know, when it comes to like IoT or AI or, you know, some of the advanced nanotechnology, I get to, I have the unfair advantage is I get to see a lot of things in the labs before they get to the marketplace. So I get to confirm, not all those become products, by the way. Right. right. I do have an unfair advantage and I use it to benefit my clients around the world. So it just reminds me of the quote, and I'm sure you're aware of it from William Gibson. Right. The future is is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So that's that's kind of when you see it in the labs. That's that's part of it. That's part of it. So you've mentioned AI, you've mentioned IoT. So what is your background in AI and and IoT? Well, at Apple in the 80s, um, I was I was in charge of business for all vertical industries. I gave the first max to NIH and for, you know, looking at research and National Institutes of Health. And um, I gave I, I did some of the first work on trying to figure out. You know what could computers do that would really enable people? And I led I led a project that did, uh, as far as I know, the first examination of AI at uh, any computer company, uh, and that was at, at Apple at the time. Mm-hmm. And this is not you know so that was the first the first approach to all this was thinking about you know what does it look like if we had um, you know, digital personas, or I call them depths, digitally engineered personalities that were the front end of computers, because we were building the first interface. Uh, Steve had seen, Steve Jobs had seen at Xerox, you know, uh, the the mouse, and we were mm-hmm. interface. And I was saying, well, what if it was animated? You know, what what would that look like? So that was a report I did uh, at, at Apple. Those days, you know, uh, we were very self managed. And then I became CEO of uh, the first industrial controls company called, when I left Apple, uh, called Yumi Corp, Ultimate Media Corp, based here in uh, California, actually in Locksburg, California. Mm-hmm. And we were uh, actually building uh, expert systems, which was an early form of AI. Um, we were programming an assembly language and then burning the mm-hmm. you know, rule based, you know, if this, then. Mm-hmm. And, the first expert systems for uh, the space station, NASA space station, for Ford. And these were fairly crude. Uh, we, we burned through assembly. We actually burned boards, put them in a rack, and you could integrate them into your system. And um, we had them for clients where you could figure out the rule. You know, there were like 100 to 300 rules for doing certain things right. in a space station. And if you did these three things and you'd need to do these three things. So we built those systems um, I built those systems in really the uh, l- late 80s at Yumi Corp. And then my background, I, I left that. Uh, it was one, one of my first exits. And I went on to forming the Institute for Global Futures after a series of other startups. But one of the areas because of that background I've stayed with is uh, being close to AI and the developments 
and I have, have advised companies like Google and McKinsey and IBM and about a hundred others in both mm-hmm. presentations and consulting, trying to figure out, you know, what are the, you know, this is early still in the game, you know, what are the business models and business justification for these technologies, but also what what's the possibilities for these technologies to be able to change our world and, and the key issues such as autonomy or, you know, controls or ethics or, or even, you know, how, what the future of AI and might be. And between that and uh, IOT, we've got a lot to talk about because we're just at the early stages. Yeah, no, we're, we're definitely at the early stages. So you mentioned that you were at yeah. Apple in the eighties. So then a lot of people miss the internet as <laughs> being a prediction. How, how were you guys or how are, how are you on well, that one? <laughs> again, you know, um, just the whole internet. That's all. Just, just, yeah. just the internet. So, uh, you got to remember the internet. We had the internet. So let yes. me, yes, let me dial right. back a little bit. So, so, um, being, you know, being in Washington, for, I was an advisor to um, uh, Health and Human Services, and my first think tank was was focused on health. And, and one of my fellows for my institute said, hey, listen, this is 1970, this is going to really date me, 1977, mm-hmm. uh, a doctor fellow of mine said to me, hey, you know, there's this thing that uh, the universities are doing and DARPA and you can get a, a, a internet account. It's an account to do networking. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about, but right. so I funded it and we got a DARPA account and he said, yeah, it's really cool. I said, what can you do with it? He said, well, you know, you send out this message, hmm. right? And then, and again, this is before the internet internet. It was then, you know, basically run by the Defense Department and academics. And, you know, we were this is before HTML, before the web. Mm-hmm. You send out an email and, and you wouldn't even call it an email. Off it. You send oh, a message. Yeah, yeah. Guess what? You get it back the next day on the computer. And I thought, OK, that sounds interesting. So I was on part of the DARPA project and we experimented with all that before there was any GUI or front end or web. But uh, at Apple, again, the unfair advantage, we had email. That's mm. how we communicated uh, between the different offices and within there. And then you got to remember, so we were still, remember, the computer was a big deal. The modems were, you had 900, you had 1,200 baud, 300 baud modems, and there was no content. <laughs> So except these emails, except these emails. So, you know, I'd get, I was getting at the time, maybe 20 or 30 emails a day at Apple, you know, and a lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there wasn't a lot of content. There wasn't the web, right? This was an early stage of, of all this. So, and we were focused on the computer at Apple as was IBM was focused on, you know, minis and mainframes and HP and the rest of us. So we didn't really get the internet except from an email point of view until yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, so I, it's evolving. You know what? We were evolving with it. But remember, a lot of this is customer adoption, penetration, and there was no network and content services. And, and, and until all that started, we didn't, there was no VoIP. So all of that was pre the web, pre VoIP, pre, you know, there's, there was no there was no 2G, 3G. There was none of that. So. Right. We, it was so we we did we miss it? Not really. We weren't ready for it. Keep in mind, the first PDA was at Apple, and uh, PDA people don't know what that mm-hmm, is. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, we had an early model of the iPhone. Newton, wasn't it? Called Newton. Newton. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there was nobody out there. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of like crickets. No, it's it's funny, and probably a more accurate way to have said it was the web. But I think a lot of people. I mean, I'm that old too. To remember my first email and I was working in my first job in, in an academic se- uh, in a setting and we were communicating with people all the way, professors all the way in Japan. Yeah. It'd be amazing. You'd wake up the next morning, there'd be a message. And right. it's like, wow. you know. Yeah. But, you know, going from that to, I guess, more the web, you know, and HTML, like you said, is, is like just, no, that's mind boggling. But in any case, um, now, so IoT, now, you know, I have my definition of IoT and it's probably pretty boring, but is this something that just naturally evolved or did you, or did you get in, or did you um, kind of forecast it or what about IoT then? I've been talking about uh, embedding intelligence at the object layer, both in digital things, you know, and, you know, when things wake up. 
So and my first book was in 95, uh, Techno Futures. Um, I envisioned a world where we would embed uh, more intelligence into things. Um, and, and, and I was influenced. At the time, I was on MIT's Media Lab, their advisory board in Europe. And uh, we were already at MIT doing all kinds of really cool things. And then I was at Motorola on their uh, research advisory board. So I was beginning to see, but really, the whole utilitarian notion that that everything would eventually be uh, networked and be on the internet. Every person, everything, every mm -hmm. component. So the notion that you'd have this um, both virtual and physical proliferation of embedded intelligence, to me, was was an early forecast uh, that I, that I made, and I, I I believed, and we just were waiting for the network to kind of catch up. Sure. And then that was one trajectory. The other was sensors. You know, we we all a sensor is is you know basically a, you know the components of a computer that are programmed around certain you know ways to capture or or if you will sense information. Be re what is that? It's a recognition of information. So that all of that technology was happening at the same time. So, you know, you have these different trajectories of the network getting, getting more proliferated, smarter, cheaper, again, Moore's law. And then of course you had new sensing technology, which enabled a lot of that. And then around the same period of time, um, of course, the, the, the geospatial intelligence emerged as a service and as a capability mm -hmm. when, Reagan declassified and right. pe people don't realize just how dramatic that was. You know, you could have the smartest devices. You could have IO IOT would have come 10 years earlier if we had not had a classified uh, GPS platform. So in many regards, geo uh, politics, the geopolitical global state of the world uh, held up uh, the ability of IOT to come sooner. We would have been talking about this, 15 years ago yeah yeah no I, and i actually yeah, i remember I, I worked in military simulation uh type environments and and it was it was a while after the declassification of the information but at that time the gps data was in i think 10 meter not 10 yard but 10 meter increments and now i think it's sub you know sub meter for sure but yeah, I mean, the, it takes a while, and the networking, like you say, had to catch up. But most of the things that we're, you know, that we're doing now um, aren't as specifically with respect to AI and IoT. Aren't that bandwidth uh, heavy? Are they? Well, not 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 yet. But again, the um, you know, with my my business hat on, mm -hmm. um, you know, you you when. It becomes, which I would I would forecast, when companies start to realize that along the you know the next evolution of uh, you know analytics and big data and cloud is going to provide, I, I would forecast that we're going to have more network robustness, robustness such as you know five G platforms, mm -hmm. ecosystems that are tied together. You know we're going to have more. 5G and well, let's just say we're going to have more network, bigger, faster uh, pipes, and that'll be every place. And all of a sudden, people are going to realize, wait a minute, I can I can start to you know capture real time data if if I have an IoT network that's designed to capture it and populate it and sense it and analyze it and tied to the cloud. So all of a sudden, now you're going to have I you know we don't have the use cases yet. Mm -hmm. And the metrics. So, you know, when folks are looking at trying to figure out, you know, what all this means to me, before you know it, we're going to have 5G rollout. We're going to have much bigger, faster pipes, and people are going to then be able to see, well, uh huh. I, you know, if I'm running, uh, I've got an energy client that's running, um, he runs energy for serving 15 states, right? It's a rural consortium. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he said, Man, I, I, I don't. It says, it, it, you got to help me figure out this whole IoT thing because I got a sense maybe we could run more efficiently. We could use our data more mm -hmm. actively, and we could provide more value to our customers. And so we're kind of at you know 
1.0, you know, IoT 1.0 in, in the sense of figuring out the models. But bef- while we're doing that, you're going to end up with an infrastructure boost that's going to be very significant. Yeah, and I think when you when you say it that way, I agree. And the 5G at first, you know, I kind of made fun of it a little bit because there were there were some applications where they're implying that they're actually going to be doing some calculations in the cloud with 5G and and then I realized no, that's nonsense, but the 5G in in most in, you know, let's say autonomous vehicles, that's 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 kind of nonsense, but in some cases the 5G is really important and it's that Venn, it's the intersection of the Venn diagram between AI and IoT and that's the models and being able to take that data from a uh, from IoT and feed it in let's say you know real time or runtime and then completely or continuously update the models for AI so that it can in turn make these rapid decisions and uh, that that makes sense to me right i mean that that kind yeah. of no, that, that kind of marriage makes sense. It makes sense. And quite frankly, even with vehicles and transportation, you can't get to where you want to get. So if you just look at cars right. as part of a, you know, autos that are self-driving or even are tr- we're trying to you know maximize the safety of, uh, of driving, right? Mm-hmm. If you, you know, the, the Look at cars as, as as a distributed network of uh, IoT nodes, of which you're going to be, you know, ca- cars will be all IoT enabled, and they will be constantly pinging in one one hundredth of a second right. off of each other, and off of satellites, and off of distributed technologies, and you know, you're talking now. Just take that model, right, of, of what we do today mm-hmm. is we drive little things, right. Now, now take that to, you know, 7.2 billion people on the planet. A lot of networking. So now take it to objects that are both physical, whether they're wearable objects that are, you know, going to be IoT enabled, or they're literally things that can be wirelessly enabled. And now you're talking about, you know, uh, you know, th- think about the, you, you still, we're still walking into hospitals, looking at x-rays and, you know, someone takes the x-rays and, you know, walks them down over here. And then, you know, the things are not connected yet that should be connected. But, you know, when you've got the ability to be able to have this kind of what I call hyper connectivity and it cuts across, it's, in other words, it's going to, IOT is going to enable and be enabled by AI, virtual reality, things even like the blockchain, it's, it's, I guess to answer your first question, I, the future of IT, which is short term, mm. it's going to be based on this convergence of other technologies that are going to be based on use cases and competitive advantage. And gee, we can do this now. We couldn't do it before. And I, I think that's the broader strategy of why um, IoT is going to be uh, uh, successful, not just because you've got increased network uh, robustness. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. And um, if you can maybe just, you know, give us a, give us a sense of where or what is AI good at today and what's it going to be good at in the future? Kind of give us a spectrum. Yeah. So what AI is good at today is one learning about, mm-hmm. it's very good about learning. So I can, you know, AI is right now, uh, whether it's mach- you know deep learning, machine learning, machine intelligence, mm-hmm. very good for uh, they're teachable today, right? You can teach an AI. And I, what I mean by AI, AI is everything from you know neural nets that are used to move trillions of dollars in nanoseconds around the world, and for financial uh, for trading of stocks and bonds and instruments, to doing you know deep analysis, to being able to run search engines, to being able to you know su- do decision support for doctors. I mean, you know everything from cognitive systems to machine learning to, you know, very rote things like chatbots or voicemail or very mundane things we take somewhat for granted, right? Mm -hmm. So everything from the most complex, which is diagnosis of genetics and, you know, disease uh, modalities to uh, big opportunities, you know, big opportunities. And then smaller things that just surrounding us continually every day, um, such as how your cell phone works is a lot of that is enabled by by AI. So I'm just going to talk about AI. So where we are today with AI, AI is very good at learning about some stuff. Mm-hmm. That stuff may be visual. 
it could be like AIs are tied to the uh, you know the, the, the proliferation of cameras on the planet that are watching and identifying uh, uh, either uh, uh, problems or even crime or looking mm-hmm. for bad guys or for just protecting, you know, protecting systems. So they can be trained to look at anomalies in other systems. You know, is that water container got a crack in it, right? That's a, right. does it, is my, uh, does my, you know, the sensor in your car that says, hey, you got to go fill up the gas, you know, that's a kind of, you know, that's a kind of, uh, fairly uh, uh dumb ai but it's you know it's it's emerging so learning stuff sensors only sensors only are, f- are really effective if you've got some ai wrapped around them okay uh you know we we're headed towards an era where more robotics uh or more self driving cars even satellites everything we have gets so it can get better and learn more and now we've got ai teaching other ais about how to optimize things. So that's already happened. That's already started. We have AIs le- teaching other AIs. And we have, so it's very good about learning, teaching, enabling us humans, uh, cooperating with humans, particularly in, in medicine, which is very exciting right now. So learning, advising, collaborating around work, uh, particularly around vertical industries, such as I mentioned financial services, I mentioned medicine. The very good. This is the early stage of kind of decision. I call decision analytics, right? Where you're starting to get advice. Eventually, there will be. Uh, again, you wouldn't want to be operated on without a Da Vinci today. And what is that? Well, right now it's telerobotic. I would forecast eventually you will have people say, you know, I'd really like to have that AI operate on me. You know, her track record's a lot, you know, better than these other doctors. And by the way, I've got the analytics. I pulled it off of yourrobodoctor.com. OK, mm-hmm. uh, so eventually we'll have that. So it's very good right now for, as I said, decision analysis, decision support, learning capabilities, monitoring, and then tying those things to alerting humans or alerting other systems when there's a, a danger. Right. Or there's a, a, a problem or there's mm-hmm. an inefficiency. Right. So that kind of awareness, which is fairly utilitarian awareness. Right. The next thing where we're going, of course, where we're going is autonomous decision analytics, where, you know, we get uh, in real time, you know, we'll each have uh, uh, we'll each have our five to six or more AIs that will be part of our life. We'll have AIs for work that will enable us. We'll have AIs in terms of advising us uh, in terms of uh, families and friends and relationships and health. So eventually you get to the point where AIs will be uh, semi-autonomous, which we have today, but eventually autonomous. So autonomous AI is going to be different. Autonomous AI will operate uh, at a speed, uh, you know, velocity, what I call cognitive velocity that is uh, not greater than humans. It's just can be applied faster than humans. And yeah. to a certain extent, we have that, you know, when you go online, you, you go searching for things, you're using an AI, AI today. Uh, in the past less than two years, year and a half, Google has made a dramatic embrace. Most of what runs uh, Google search engine, increasingly others, and is is a, is a form of AI that that was a major sure. position they did. So you have to look at that as kind of the you know the the canary in the mine. That's the beginning of an early massification and adoption of AI for all industries, for all uh, businesses, and for uh, all governments certainly. So you, where it's going to head in the future of AI is more autonomy, better learning. And I would forecast uh, better uh, help for uh, humans and human problems. So I'll give you a perfect example. So uh, I, I did a, I did a talk for the you keynote know, for the World Bank uh, on the future of you know creating a digital supply chain, which doesn't exist. For mm-hmm. So we 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 there's about a billion and change of folks on the planet today that can't get the food they need. They're either undernourished or they're in starvation, just in general, okay? Think about that. It's 2018, and we can't get the food. We make plenty of food. Yeah, we make enough. But we can't get it because the supply chain 
is not visible and, and integrated. And there's no reason why we can't do that. It's a supply chain management issue, or is it? So I said, so I gave a presentation with an analysis about that. And really what it is, is we need to transform and create, there is no digital supply chain for agriculture and food. How about that? So World Bank's very concerned about that. And I said, well, and what would really help is if we had a group of, you know, AIs on the platform that were tied to IoT in fields and in all the different parts of the supply chain from, you know, seed to product to shelf, right? So mm-hmm. that's just an example of people just don't realize that, you know, we're living in a world where some of our largest complex challenges facing our civilization, uh, we could be applying AI and IoT together to be able to come up with better solution sets to deal with things that are as fundamental as, you know, how we manage water over the next, you know, five to 20 years. Cape Town has no more water because they didn't plan appropriately. In the past decade, mm-hmm. uh, we had a tsunami in uh, in Asia uh, over the past decade. Not even that, and we have technology for sensing and I, you know sensors, floating sensors, and IoT. That's an IoT platform, but people weren't using the data. So I, I, again, you know, you don't have to think about exotic things like you know will you know will AI and IoT lead to you know war of you know zombie robots taking over the planet there's lots of use cases that businesses need and our society needs that through the fusion of smarter ai and more uh integrated uh iot that i think you're talking about just a transformation of some basic things and then transformation of some much other things we will have ais that will be winning maybe even Nobel Prizes. We will have AIs that are solving diseases that humans can't. Keep in mind, you know, computers were used to map the original uh, DNA sequence, right? Computers. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for the network, meaning the internet and computers, we wouldn't have mapped sufficiently the DNA, uh, the first DNA sequence. Now what cost, you know, the better part of $50 million uh, costs you know, uh, under a thousand dollars. So that's just computers and the internet. What do you, you know, the next generation of AI, particularly with IOT could end up accelerating all that and creating a lot more. It could be transformations in healthcare, transportation, certainly in, in food and, and ag, but also in fundamental things like, uh, how you delight customers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. I, and so I want to kind of try to bring this down to a little bit of firmer Terra. Um, uh, for everyone listening, okay, I can I can hear what you're saying. AI today is good is good for learning. Um, it's it's good for teaching. I think I can get there. Monitoring, alerting, like you were saying, and then you're saying in the future it's going to be more autonomous. So we're you know this is more of a semi-autonomous. It's more an advisory role. It tells us things, although it's being used in some cases autonomously. But what's the tr- I mean I understand you know the the food example or the food chain example. But if you're saying then in the future, AI is going to be more autonomous, is that what you're suggesting that people listening to the, are, you know, listening to us right now are thinking about how to use AI in the future? Just thinking about it to that it's going to be autonomous or do you have any other advice on the future for AI? Well, I think that's just that's just a framework to think about the capability set. I think the more important thing is having uh, being able to build value. So if mm-hmm. you're, you know, if you're in. Uh, uh, if you're manufacturing stuff or you're a SaaS based company or you're in, 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 in entertainment or media um, or any vertical, you know, I think the challenge is going to be, you know, what are the cognitive services that AIs could provide that would give you an edge to understand? I mean, we have a problem right now. We, we've, we're in the era of big data, which means that we have too much data to figure out where the business value is and how is it going to support our business strategy. So mm-hmm. if you are if you're running a large SaaS based global uh, media a- enterprise, you're really interested in wh- wh- what are my customers? You know, where's the market? Where's the where my competition going? How can I delight my customers better and provide you know take the friction out of the relationship or even optimize knowledge? 
of so that we could deploy my AIs for better analytics or metrics or even be able to create products and services that I learn from my AI analytics that will not just delight my customer, but create entirely new uh, opportunities and new markets. I think that's that's the upside. And, you know, we've got a lot of data, simply put, that we don't, you know, we went through an era where we had data that was paper, and then we went ahead and scanned all of it and put it in what we call the data warehouse. Uh, nobody read it when it was there, whether it was paper or whether it was digital. We had no way to search it. Then we, you know, we turned it into databases, and it's searchable. Gee, that's great. But we need AIs to help us figure out what customers want, where markets want, how to increase, you know, adoptability, and also how to create products and services that I think will delight folks that we're not doing. Because right now, the product cycle for development is based on either market research, which uses to a certain extent some some AI, not enough, but it's a very human, arbitrary kind of process. That's why we mm -hmm. There's a lot of lot of failures in all that. The the other part of this is just about efficiency. Are there more efficient ways for us to run businesses, our businesses that we can learn from this mashup of AI and IoT? And I, I think that that's probably a whole area of of tremendous opportunity. But just if you're just looking from the point of view of of trying to capture, understand, and and build more insight into the customer's mindset about what he or she wants is interested in not just today but tomorrow, I think AIs can help with that dramatically. And I think that's the future of what I mean by kind of this cognitive advisory capability. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, what you're what you're really describing is innovation and invention on one side and operational efficiency on the other side. And but most of what you're saying now I can swap in the word analytics and we are using, for example, usability models, utility models to understand how our customers are using our products, what they're using it for. And the delta there is where we can innovate on our products. We are using analytics for operational efficiency asset utilization today. So what I'm trying to understand is, is, is it just better? Is it just better what we have today or is it going to be something or, you know, or in the future, is it going to be something different than what we have today? Because so, we're doing more or less what you said today. Yeah. So uh, you, you, you have most of it right, except for one secret. All right. Okay. So can, can, you keep it, can you keep a secret? I can. All right. Here we go. It's just between you, me, and <laughs> all of your listeners. Here's, the, here's the, the big secret. We're in the midst of an AI war right now. Mm -hmm. Who is in that AI war? Well, the usual suspects. Google. Microsoft, Apple, Baidu, there's about 10 others, mm -hmm. Samsung. And, and how is it working out? Well, how it works out is we're, you have major competitive companies. By the way, that's at the core. And then you've got five other layers of enablers and folks that are divided up. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a karetsu of AI companies that are doing meaning a Karetsu, meaning like an ecosystem, an AI ecosystem of battles and battlers that are going on right now in terms of competition. Why? You put your finger on it. It's not that we're not using analytics. Yeah, we're using analytics. But the it's who has the best AI to be able to do, you know, higher velocity decision making. Who has the best AI to figure out, you know, blue ocean opportunities where, we should be exploiting new markets and customer segments that others are not or not doing a good job. It's who's got smarter capabilities that can be delivered faster for competitive advantage. It's not just about, okay, check the box, cloud, check, analytics, check. Uh, no, 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 we're not. And, and, that's, and that's, that's the misnomer. It's like IoT and AI are just two... There's AI, IoT, blockchain, AI, VR, and AR. These are just the weapons in this mm -hmm. global battle for customer market share, for profitability, for, you know, you got to reverse the algorithm. It's not just, you know, that we're doing these things. It's how well you're doing them. 
And there's different flavors of AIs that are being trained to be involved in this. And, and, and the ones that are the smarter have the evidence of, again, the metrics are, are, are things like market share and things like product acceleration and things like delighting customers and creating loyalty and identity. So that's the war that we're in right now. This is not this is not the far future. This is going on right now. It's just going to get, you know, it's like training your armies for this kind of battle. This has already been going on. The issue now is there's just so much, you know, so much mind, there's so much wallet share. There's only so much customer mind share. And, you know, there's only so many markets. So at the end of the day, that's the battle that's going on. You can see it between, you know, on the AI side. The most obvious example is, uh, you know, uh, 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 my my wife the other day was saying how she was that that uh, uh, Alexa wasn't operating properly. I, I plugged it into the kitchen so I could watch what she and the kids were, were doing. And, you know, she kept I said, well, show me what you're doing. She said, well, you know, I talked to Siri and Siri wasn't doing it. wasn't working. I said, you mean Alexa? She <laughs> said, no, I mean Siri. <laughs> I said, you understand that Alexa doesn't respond to Siri, right? She said, oh, I got confused because Siri's on my phone. Right. Siri. Ale- what, what I'm trying to say is these are obvious examples of the foray. You know, why did Amazon give away basically a lost leader? Uh, uh, in the in the game, what what is that? You know, Alexa is an IoT AI. It's the largest uh, experiment for AI. Where basically it was brilliant. They gave it away to everybody, and uh, they did what Nest was another example that Google did. Nest never turned on. So just imagine every object waking up tied to a network that can both give receive information. And then what are the implications of all that in terms of IoT, in terms of your business? Yeah. No, no. And, and I, think I, I think I'm getting something I can get my hands on and, uh, from a business perspective. And that is what you're saying, I think, is AI is going to make, let's call it analytics, but let's, let's say AI is going to make analytics faster and better or maybe more usable and that i can that i can get my hands around that's right is that's right i mean at a high level exactly that's that's yeah. exactly right you know for competitive reasons i mean that's and, right and, that's right. right and you that's right and it's tunable that's the other really important thing it's tunable, tunable. and it will be continue and then eventually it'll be tunable from an opportunity uh a, a, you know analysis point of view not just by you the human but by other ais Right, and this is where you get into your autonomy that you were talking about earlier. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, that's, so does this link then, I mean, you've coined the term AI economy. I think you've coined it. And, and is this does this kind of all funnel into the AI economy? Yes. Yes, it does. So the, I, the reason I, I look at it, I call it the AI economy, is because it's not just an ecosystem of, you know, separate things. Right. It's all connected. And, you know, and IOT is a fundamental part of this AI economy, right? Because if you just look at AI as making everything smarter, more in tune with market needs, opportunity analysis, if you look at it as an economic force, a global economic force that sits on top of every industry, sits on top of Every interaction sits on top of media, healthcare, manufacturing. All of a sudden, you have a very different perspective about it. So this is, you know, the, the, if you look at the entire supply chain from the in terms of the AI economy, beginning with, you know, uh, IP, intellectual property, and then of course venture capital, and then in government investments, which are extensive. And you look at the number of companies that are involved just in R and D with AI. Mm-hmm. And then, so now that that's, those are four sectors, economic sectors, of which there already are, are hundreds of billions of dollars spent. All right. The better part of a half a trillion dollars spent just in those before you get to monetizing them with products. Right. Mm-hmm. So now mm-hmm. you're, you're talking about, and then, then the monetization of the products is just beginning. Right. <laughs> 
and and we're be, I mean, uh, you got you know, medical technology is not IO simple thing is not doesn't talk to each other as much as it it will, right? Uh, even in an age of you know Bluetooth and all that, it will. So what are the implications for every device, every product, every service, and then every virtual object in on the web being AI enabled and also IoT enabled. Now you've got a very different kind of world and it's the economics that will drive this, that will help this, may, that, that will make this a reality. Meaning it's, you know, it's the e-commerce, it's the exchange of value, it's the ability to be able to create entirely new business models, it's in, enabling and, if you will, transforming existing business models. I mean, when we talk about industry or manufacturing, you know, I have a piece on manufacturing 4.0, you know, it's, it doesn't, you can't get there without this next generation of smarter AI. No, I, 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 I like it. And it kind of parallels something I call uh, the outcome economy, but your AI economy, like my outcome economy is the summation of a number of ecosystems. And within those ecosystems, you're, you're saying AI is driving the different ecosystems. You could have outcomes driving them as well. But it's effectively, you're saying is, I didn't realize, I didn't know the half a trillion dollar spent uh, statistics. That's huge. And what you're saying is you're calling it an economy because the ramifications of AI are just our economy size numbers, right? They're in the trillions, not in the billions. And so um, well, I'm with you on that. I'm, it, I'm with you on that. It will, in other words, it will be, well, this is the early stages of it, and it will increase. And then it will, interestingly, in, it will go away. It'll, it'll become invisible because right. every like all technology. That, right. So things that, you know, things that uh, we take for granted in healthcare or transportation or manufacturing, they'll just make those things more competitive and greater value. And you'll end up with, you know, just, I think, more efficient, uh, more effective, but you'll end up with something else too. And that's, that's the other point, which is you'll end up with a whole new economic order of businesses and business models that didn't exist before. Think about it. Yeah. And this is why they're in this, you know, that's where the big secret comes in, right? That's because right. everyone's warring to get to this new this new economic that, world order that, that you're talking about. Yeah, so in other words, what happens is it's like we – managing, uh, I call uh, game-changing uh, trends is one thing, but being able to forecast them is really what I'm keenly interested in because you don't want to be the last guy or gal to find, you know, a chair when the music stops. You, you want to be on top of that. And, I, yeah. and and kind of what's happened is we and we've seen this with cloud analytics is that people wait uh, too long. You know, a digital transformation we've talked about waited people waited too long and they've been out competed by others because keep in mind the con- I believe the customer uh, uh, the customer the consumer are the ones driving change. They were the first ones. It was really the marketplace of customer and consumers that forced Microsoft and, and other computer companies to realize that the internet was something that people wanted. They wanted the internet. I mean, I remember battling with financial service companies about why they were going to put, uh, they were going to not just allow, but they were going to enable their customers to put like their financial portfolios online. So they could see, they would have visibility. Now you've got the blockchain, which again, we're just beginning. I'm working on a couple of blockchain IOT projects now, which I think are very dramatic because it goes to some larger, I think, motivations that people have in the marketplace. Once there's transparency, once there's accountability, once there's trust uh, vis-a-vis the blockchain, you're not going to go back on that. That's not going to, we're not going to, it's not, and you're not going to not be a, you know, a network-based digital transformation company. You, everybody is, you are or you're not, you know, in other words, you, these, these are things you can't go back in time about. If you're if you're producing great hot dogs or you're in the restaurant business, you know, uh, and you and you're producing a fantastic, you know, uh, chicken marsala. Gee, that's great. But you know, if you're in a world where these innovations are creating competitive advantages, you can't decide you're going to turn that off unless you want to go, you know, make 
chocolate bars. And that's great, by the way. There's, there's, a, there's room for all of that in the marketplace. Not everything has to be enabled. But that right. chocolate, where you get your chocolate from, likely will be on the blockchain and likely will be, there'll be IoT sensors in the, uh, in the cocoa uh, <laughs> fields in Madagascar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I, I certainly have my opinions on blockchain, and they're certainly related to the future, not the present. But I want to go back to um, what you're talking about and, and in terms of the AI economy. And I want to bring in the concept of ROI here, because I agree with you. So you don't want to be when the, when that music stops, you don't want to be the last person that doesn't have a seat. In other words, you need to make sure you are in the market, uh, you're in the game. At the same time, you don't want to be necessarily, be, you don't want to be there before the market's ready. Um, so what I generally advise my clients are is do the strategic thinking now, you know, roll it into your company's wider strategic thinking, and then you can decide when to pull the trigger. But you, you do need to move early, and I think this applies to AI as well, from a strategic thinking point of view. Um, but like you said, a majority, so AI has been around 60 odd years, right? And still a majority, I've had four, five, four, four people on this mini series so far, two of them have PhDs. You're including, you're one of the two. It, it's still early days. It's still, it's still the eggheads mostly. So I'd like to get your perspective on doing business with our, with, with IO, uh, with AI, but in particular, how are you measuring the, uh, you know, the ROI on AI? Uh, I guess it's just a traditional way, but I'd like to get your thoughts on this transition from, yeah, there's a lot of spending that's going on all the way from developing that IP monet, uh, and then trying to monetize that IP with VCs. But that's still early days. It's not You're not going to reach, reach escape velocity until you're able to go to scale. And you're able, Alexa's a good example, but until you're able to go to scale. So how do businesses, again, mostly who's listening to us right now, but how are they going to measure a return on this investment because it's still pretty it's still futuristic isn't it well yes and and yes and no meaning uh uh it's still futuristic if you but you got to kind of reset how you're thinking about it right that's what okay. i recommend i mean in other words if you're uh if you are expecting to do the ai thing uh look let me, let me put perspective. If you're building a strategic plan, AI should be part of your strategic plan, whether you're planning to implement things over the next 30 days or the next, uh, you know, 30 months. All right. I agree. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, you don't have to go whole hog. What I recommend to my clients, and, and my clients are generally the largest companies in the world, uh, and then I've got the smallest companies in the world, which are startups. And what I recommend is that you – carved out uh, what I call these future labs, right? And the future future lab concept is, all right, you know, you, you don't have to necessarily, if you don't see a business case for implementing, you know, a, a, a company-wide transformation or a product-wide transformation, mm -hmm. AI, I get it, okay. Uh, not everybody's doing that. There, there are folks in the genomics area that, you know, are, are focusing, you know, specifically on that or folks in manufacturing, folks... But you know, I would say when it comes to that, cover, you know, start a future lab. What's a future lab? Future lab mm -hmm. is the concept of it's a it's a it's a small platform change that you're going to add AI and build up the case inside of that where you're going to try some things, learn some things, you know, quick failure, quick success. You're going to try some stuff up. So if you're in the energy space, you know, future lab is which I've, I've done with some clients is, you know, we're going to go work and put uh, uh, AI over here in this operation and, and see what we learn from that. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go all in, right? <clears throat> that's right. one. So, and, and you can, and that's what I'd recommend you do that. The other is from a product point of view, maybe what we do is we, uh, for a, a SaaS based company I, I, I'm, I'm working with, you know, we decided that was a more comprehensive thing. That was a reason we added AI in, in stealth mode, to a product offering because it would be a key differentiator for competitive advantage in a very noisy marketplace. Okay. So this is where branding, business strategy, and product development meet. And we, by the way, we did it in like two months. We didn't do it in like, you know, six years. So, mm -hmm. you know, having been part of 
the early stages of strategic planning and having helped create a lot of strategic planning, this whole idea of rapid strategic planning where you know you're basically you've got an idea, one page, you know, or it's a deck with nothing, you know, more than ten slides, boom, bang, we'll get this done now. Right? That's a very right. different company. And we'll put it in front of customers that's before right. we spend a lot of money. On that's it. right. Yeah. And, and not even customers, but a lot of customers you gotta remember are not, you know, you you want the right kind of customers. But often mm-hmm. you gotta do something. I mean, Steve Jobs didn't go to the board of Apple and say, this is when he came back, hey, I've got this great idea about, you know, I know we're in the computer business, that's our core competencies and all that, but I've got this idea about doing a phone. Mm. You know, and, and if he hadn't owned the company and controlled the company, the board would have thrown him out of there and replaced him again. Why? Because the core competency was what? Computing. What do we need a phone for? But the reality was the phone was the next computer. Right. So so what I'm saying is set up a future lab, recognize, try something from a product point of view that you think will delight people. And and let me just use as part of a case. Keep in mind what happened at Google, which has not been well uh, written about. But what happened at Google was they were experimenting with with, you know, there was a small what I call a future lab company in London that had some AI, some machine learning breakthroughs, deep learning, really breakthroughs in AI. And they started integrating that into their search engine. All of a sudden, it started creating phenomena that they didn't quite understand, but it was producing uh, metrics that were better than the human-enabled metrics. So they started turning over more and more. And I've seen this happen now on three or four occasions. Mm -hmm. AI starts producing monetizable Results. Those are results that have metrics that can be measured, and those metrics can be translated into dollars. And Google's business is, you know, ad words, and you know, the, the the speed and accuracy of matching up what people want, and then monetizing that digital exhaust. They were mm-hmm. results faster than anybody else was able to produce, either AI or human. So they made a shift. I know a number of other companies that, that have, again, hard, fast ROI with either trading platform. I mean, GE had a, a real estate platform that they were using what we call a black box, and they didn't understand quite exactly how the blocks, black box worked. But guess what? When, it, when making decisions for making large transactions, it showed up in a way they were able to use it to make analysis. They didn't exactly know how it worked, but it was giving them results that translated into the bottom line, strong AI ROI. Same mm-hmm, tra- mm-hmm. Neural nets in the trading space have been, that's been a well-kept secret for the past, I would say, almost eight years or more have been driving value in the trillions. People just don't talk about it. Now, the, the, the antithesis, the dark side of that is the flash crash uh, that happened uh, which, if you if you kind of examine that, was driven by you know a basically battling AIs. Yes, uh, yeah. battling AI. <laughs> yeah, I know AI trader that you know that went bad. You, there was a couple of trillion dollars plus worth of value mm-hmm. that was sucked out of the uh, economy. That was AIs misused in some regards. What, what I'm trying to say is that the horse has already left the barn. And when it comes to you know uh, ROIs, there's a lot of people who are tight-lipped about the advantage that this is their strategic advantage that is responsible for their uh, ROI. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, but, no, I think yeah. you know, I, I think I, I think I want to frame what you said in a slightly different way, and I think it's a good way to kind of conclude our podcast with the best practice or advice to our listeners. And when I ask you about AI. You know, what your response was, okay, I think you need to reset your thinking. Good, I'm with you on that. And then you said, whether you're planning out 30 days or 30 months, you need to put together a strategic plan. Makes sense. And then I like this, you know, carve out a future lab. So it's a, it's a relatively small budget. And then start adding AI to experiment. And then the next step being start adding it to your products, you know, to, to gain this extra innovation for this competitive advantage. And then I think what I'm going to put words in your mouth, but I think what you're, you know, to close the loop on the ROI is once you've integrated into your existing products, you can measure their, not necessarily their ROI, but their incremental ROI. 
And that incremental ROI from what the product was doing, whether it's a Google search or something different to what it's doing, the ROI it's achieving with AI does give you an incremental AI. So is that a good way to kind of summarize this, you know, this this best practice slash way of measuring AI ROI? Yeah. And I would just add to that really quickly, you know, disrupt yourself first before you get disrupted. And don't be, you know, be be bold in trying some stuff. You got to have a culture that tries stuff before everybody else does. Because if you look at the largest, most valuable companies in the world, they didn't get there because they didn't take risks or they weren't courageous. You've got to be willing to take risks and be courageous and try some stuff. If everybody else is doing it and you're not, that's one way. But I suggest that you step up and be bold because I think you'll get a better return on investment. I like that being bold. Well, James, where can people find out more about your about you and and your company's offering? Well, globalfuturist.com uh, okay. is my website. Yeah. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at futureguru hashtag future. Like and then, like if you want to get real time insights, I have plenty of articles and podcasts and well, not about podcasts, but video stuff on my website, but also my book, Future Smart. You can check that out. Future Smart will give you a kind of, it's only good for the next 100 years. After that, don't email. <laughs> yeah, it'll be like the emails that we were exchanging overnight. All right. Well, I'll put everyone, I'll put this all in the show analysis notes like usual. And with that, James, uh, thank you. It was very enjoyable and insightful. And I hope to talk to you soon. Great. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. That was a fun talk with James Canton of the Institute for Global Futures. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent on Twitter. And of course, you can support this show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP training and certification program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is SME All-Star. How to Develop an IoT Business Around Data with Christian Schaefer. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Till next week, may your path to IoT business be a predictable one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show.